Greetings to all. This is Vipul Agrawal, and today we have Colonel Aris Sidhu from the Mechanized Infantry, and he is well versed with the ground reality during the IPKF operations in Sri Lanka. It's a pleasure and honor to have you here with us, sir. And thank you, thank you, Vipul. It's a pleasure, sir. And uh, the viewers would really be intrigued to know about the Indo-Sri Lankan Peace Accord, as it is known as. What is the background and the ground reality of this peace accord, and how did the agreement shape up? Uh, thank you, Weber, for this opportunity to talk about the Indo-Sri Lanka agreement of, which was signed on 29th July 1987 between. Uh, the President of Sri Lanka and the Prime Minister of uh, India. And good evening to all the viewers. Uh, this uh, agreement was signed on 29th of uh, July, 1987, in a bit of a hurry, in case uh, I were to use the phrase. And this is a very interesting agreement between two countries. It has got a past. It has got some of the past, which has been brought into the agreement without specifying what it is. It also has some of the unresolved uh, past, which was to be resolved in a reasonable time frame of six weeks of the signing of the accord. The background to the agreement is that uh, there was uh, a disconnect between the Indian and the Sri Lankan government on the handling of the ethnic discord in Sri Lanka, primarily because of the affinity between the ethnic minority, that is the Tamils in uh, Sri Lanka, who were the sovereigns, who were subject to the uh, sovereignty of Sri Lanka. And between the Tamils of uh, India, which populate the Tamil Nadu province uh, adjoining uh, Sri Lanka. Right. Uh, having, having said this, this uh, disconnect between the Indian and the Sri Lankan government was carrying on for uh, quite some time. And as in when we go through the wordings of the accord, it will become quite clear what it was. Because uh, there was no meeting point between the interests of uh, the Indian government and the Sri Lankan government, India was, and the prevarication by the Sri Lankan government in resolving the issues, which they accepted, uh, they were there. The Indian government forced was uh, forced to go into a escalatory escalatory spiral okay. firstly they decided to resolve it through negotiations the sri lankan government uh, prevaricated the negotiations progressed for quite some time then there was a pause there was no response from the sri lankan government Indian government then decided to take the next escalatory ladder, that is to send in uh, humanitarian assistance uh, through uh, uh, ships of the merchant shipping, which was uh, turned back by the Sri Lankan uh, Navy. Then it was followed by an enforced humanitarian airdrop, which is known as Operation Pumalai, which was carried out by the Indian uh, Air Force over the Jaffna Peninsula. Right. And subsequently, there was an unstated uh, threat of a military response also. Yes. Thereafter, once the Sri Lankan government was uh, reconciled to the aspect that India wants to resolve uh, the issues to be resolved by force, they went in for a hurried last moment. Uh, negotiations for finalizing the accord and that we can surmise is because of the annexure one to the agreement there is only one annexure presumably they felt that there may be a requirement of another hence rather than it being called as an annexure it was termed as annexure one to the agreement which had certain aspects mentioned 
which were only a clarification of what had been mentioned in the main agreement. Okay. So this is as far as the background of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord is concerned. Now, going through the Accord, there are certain uh, interesting uh, facets, which I will highlight. First is that there was a political component which had been addressed in this Accord. Then there was a military component which was to be addressed in this Accord. There are three clear strengths which emerge from it. One is the safeguarding of the interests of the government of Sri Lanka. Second is the safeguarding of the interests of the Tamil minority of Sri Lanka. And third is uh, acceptance of India's position as a interested uh, third party and the guarantor of this accord. Here, there is one very interesting aspect which I would like to highlight, and it is that uh, the India was required not only to ensure that the accord is implemented, that is guaranteed, but also to enforce the provisions in case either of the two uh, principal proponents, that is the Sri Lankan government and the Sri Lankan Tamils, they failed to implement the accord, what they were required to do. Okay. Uh, there is another very interesting aspect also, and which is that in this case, the agreement was signed between India as the guarantor of the accord and between the government of Sri Lanka. This agreement does not have the signatures or uh, involvement on the final day in the signing of the Tamils, either through any political uh, party representation or through the representation of the majority uh, Tamil militant organizations uh, who are the apt to be referred to as uh, paramilitary force organizations in this uh, accord. So, when we come to the aspects of the Sri Lankan government's uh, interest, we see that all the interests of the Sri Lankan government, including its sovereignty, the unity and the territorial integrity of the country as a whole, were guaranteed by India. Also, right. India ipso facto guaranteed this uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity on behalf of the Tamil ethnic minority, because it was the guarantor of the accord of the third party, which was not signing it. Correct. All provisions of the Sri Lankan constitution, which needed to be amended, were to be done by the Sri Lankan government only. It was left to the president of Sri Lanka for the amendment of the Sri Lankan government. Uh, of Sri Lankan constitution. It was also left to the president of Sri Lanka to invite observers from the election commission of India for the referendums and the general elections as and when they were required to take place. And it was also left to the president of Sri Lanka to invite the Sh uh, Indian peacekeeping force for implementation of the accord and if needed for the enforcement of this accord. Okay. So Sri Lanka got whatever it wanted as far as its own interests were concerned from this uh, accord. This also ipso facto implies that India was not interested in any territorial breakup of the state of Sri Lanka. It was not in its interest. After having uh, discussed the aspect of the interest of the Sri Lankan state, we then go to the uh, interests of the Tamil uh, ethnic minority in Sri Lanka. One of the biggest demands of the Tamil militants was that the 
their uh, state sponsored uh, persecution should be stopped the tamils also expressed in private their apprehensions that they did not trust the words given by the government of sri lanka okay. and hence and hence they wanted india uh, to guarantee whatever is written in the accord and under the circumstances india undertook the best possible terms and negotiations uh, in the interest of the tamil minority so when we look at it from the aspect of the tamil interests one of the biggest aspect was that they did not uh, trust the word of the sri lankan government there were very strict timelines uh, laid within the uh, within the accord the accord was implemented of exactly on the date on which it was signed it was also on the same date that the sri lankan uh, president shri julius jayawardene uh, gave it in writing to the government of india to dispatch a indian uh, peacekeeping force right. for implementation right. of the accord and the indian government also reacted very swiftly by passing orders for the dispatch of this uh, peacekeeping force on the very same day to the indian military and the operations commenced that same night itself to induct the indian peacekeeping force into the jaffna peninsula right now when we look at the other timelines the hostilities by the sri lankan government there was to be a cessation within 48 hours of signing of this agreement there was to be a surrender of weapons by all the militant organizations primarily that is the tamil militant uh, organizations within 72 hours of the cessation of hostilities correct that is 48 hours plus 72 hours that's a very fine and a very strict uh, timeline and this was not that the commencement of the surrender of weapons was to be there in 72 hours it was to be completed by 72 hours okay and immediately on the uh, yet surrender of weapons the sri lankan army in the northern and the eastern provinces was to be confined to the barracks that is their positions as it was on may 1987 okay and then comes the aspect of uh, the uh, political amnesty uh, to the political persons who had been arrested and to the militants uh, who had been apprehended under the emergency provision so this emergency provisions of the sri lankan constitution were to be withdrawn by 15th of august and a general amnesty to was to be announced uh, by uh, president uh, of sri lanka to all those who were arrested and apprehended uh, in terms of this uh, emergency uh, provisions of the constitution of uh, sri lanka right the, there was to be a temporary unification of uh, the northern and the eastern provinces of uh, sri lanka and after this unification there was to be a general election which was to be completed by 31st of december 1987 or within 3 months of the signing of this uh, agreement between the uh, government of india and the government of uh, sri lanka and this uh, uh, general elections were to be followed by a referendum not later than 31st of december 1988 only in the eastern provinces to ascertain the wishes of the people whether they wish to remain united with the northern provinces or wish to look at a separate eastern province okay 
there was another interesting uh, aspect which was uh, mentioned in the annexure to the uh, agreement that <coughs> the observers from the election commission of india were uh, to be involved in the conduct of the general election and especially the referendum in the eastern provinces right india was required to ensure that it uh, uh, repatriates the indian citizens that is the tamils without citizenship rights in sri lanka back to india the sri lankan government was to ensure that the sri lankan refugees who had crossed over to india will be taken back by them in a very swift uh, time frame and all possible assistance by the indian navy was to be given as well as the indian military in ensuring that there are no bases held by the tamil militant organization on the mainland of india for operations against sri lanka sure. so in a nutshell these are the aspects of the uh, agreement excepting for one which i mentioned <coughs> that there is a past which uh, yeah, which has been uh, carried forward which deals with the para 2.15 of the indo sri lanka agreement which clearly mentions that the proposals which have been discussed between the interlocutories of the two government from 4th may 1986 to 19th december 1986 will be deemed to be part of this agreement but what is this what are these uh, provisions which have been uh, discussed and verbally negotiated is not mentioned therein also it mentions interestingly <coughs> that all the additional aspects which have not been agreed to between the two countries and which are contentious this shall be resolved within 6 weeks of the signing of this agreement yes sir so so what are your further analysis on the indo sri lankan agreement well this uh, indo sri lankan agreement it had uh, one uh, additional uh, point also which was that the tamil militants at the discretion of the government of uh, sri lanka were to be absorbed Uh, within the sri lankan uh, security forces so there was this was a way of uh, ensuring a means of livelihood for the tamil militants who had been working as part of the various uh, tamil militant uh, organizations right and this uh, agreement it also formed the basis uh, for the operational uh, commitments of the indian peacekeeping force the tasks which were assigned to the indian uh, peacekeeping force were in terms of this agreement only so when you when we look at it uh, holistically that is the political and the military aspects of this agreement right the indian peacekeeping force was uh, given political military tasks to be performed okay so so if we look at uh, the aspects of the milit first the military aspects of the provisions of the government the indian peacekeeping force inducted into sri lanka within a acceptable time frame which is uh, in itself uh, a very swift it is difficult to uh, uh, regroup reorganize and induct a peacekeeping force uh, that to uh, for divisional size force that is roughly around 10000 out troops along with their logistics into a offshore military operation the second aspect is that it did commence its uh, duties for uh, accepting the surrender of weapons by the tamil militant organizations it's a different issue that uh, the largest tamil militant organization which is the liberation tigers of tamil elam uh, <clears throat> known as uh, ltte right. it 
uh, did not abide by the terms of the conditions of the accord and surrendered just a few uh, percentage of its old and antiquated uh, weapons only. The Mil uh, there was uh, military operations which were conducted against the LTTE thereafter in the month of October 1987. And it is difficult to uh, undertake a complete annihilation of uh, militancy, especially in an area which we are not familiar with. But the LTTE was forced to move out from the populated uh, space of uh, Jaffna and from in the eastern provinces and to shift into the jungles. As a result of which there was the disconnect between its uh, political base uh, within the population of the ethnic Tamil minority and right. its uh, leadership. Okay. Then we look at the key aspects of the accord. The elections to the general uh, uh, to the provincial assemblies, that is the United Provincial Assembly of Northern and Eastern Provinces, were completed. The referendum in uh, Eastern uh, uh, this uh, province was completed on uh, 10th of December 1988. And by 10th December 1988, the head of the Indian peacekeep Peacekeeping Force, the general officer commanding, then Lieutenant General A.S. Kalkat was able to signal uh, to Delhi that mission is accomplished and awaiting further orders. Okay. So the IPKF from its side had accomplished all the assigned political political uh, military objectives. Okay. So, uh, so that you have spoken about the military and political accomplishments and the. Uh, you know, the respective tasks which were given. What was in particular your role in the IPKF operations and what were the circumstances in which the MEC infantry was deployed in Srinagar? You see, the mechanized infantry uh, component, that is the mechanized forces and subsequently the armor component also, they were grouped as part of the <coughs> Indian peacekeeping force, primarily because of the uncertainty which existed as to the reactions of the hotheads within the Sri Lankan army and the Sri Lankan security forces, as to the induction of uh, foreign army within their uh, sovereign uh, territory. So and rather than uh, for being used against the, uh, for countering the insurgency in Sri Lanka, the primary task of uh, keeping this uh, force as part of the uh, Indian peacekeeping force was to be ready for taking on any contingencies which came in from the hotheads of the Sri Lankan regular army. The units, uh, initially there was 15 mechanized infantry which was uh, grouped as part of the uh, Indian peacekeeping force. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, at its peak, once the active operations commenced and uh, there was induction of additional uh, divisions uh, into Sri Lanka, at its peak, there were uh, two mechanized infantry battalions, uh, independent uh, recce and support company, and an armored regiment from the mechanized forces, which were part of the IPKF grouping. Right. Once uh, these forces had been inducted into the island, then uh, they were also employed for uh, employed in counterinsurgency grid in assisting the uh, infantry in achieving of their objectives. Their most critical requirement uh, came up in the initial stages of the IPK of operations against the LTTE in Jaffna in October 1987. The hot war type conditions, they commenced with effect from uh, 10th of uh, October 1987. And uh, suddenly the LTTE uh, preparations and their uh, for meeting such a contingency became clear. 
the infantry was uh, being uh, subjected to multifarious attacks on the advances which they were planning to undertake and to minimize the casualties the mechanized infantry was employed in uh, packing penny packets in the initial stages which <clears throat> with hindsight comes about that it was a mistake on the part of the ipkf uh, hierarchy because once you uh, utilize such a potent force in penny packets this energy which is required to be generated by such a force could not be generated right not being under the unitary command and control uh, the tactics which are being employed by the ltte against the ipkf uh, advance were generally not familiar with the troops at the lower level and we suffered maximum casualties out of the total casualties in ipk suffered by the mechanized infantry during the first week of the intense military operations okay however we were however we were swift to learn and uh, we put across a point that there is to be a unitary command and control there is to be uh, a, a, a en masse deployment of the mechanized forces in sri lanka because they generate their own synergies and they are better able to uh, uh, employ their full potential against the ltt and very importantly to minimize the casualties once this was accepted then the mechanized infantry and the armor they came into its own we had uh, joint uh, combat task forces which were under command of the armor and the mechanized infantry officers which carried out all the tasks which initially had been assigned to the mechanized infantry and where maximum casualties were suffered without uh, any uh, major casualties at all in the subsequent phases and we were also able to assist in the speeding up of the operations because there was a decision dilemma which was imposed on the minds of the ltt military hierarchy because of the constant cross country maneuvers which were being undertaken by the mechanized uh, task forces and the speed and the unexpected and unexpectedness of their uh, movements right so once the active phase of the operations had been conducted then the mechanized forces were uh, pulled back <clears throat> and deployed in counter insurgency grid and once it was decided that it's going to be a long drawn out affair and uh, additional uh, divisions had been inducted into vavunia trincomali and uh, in uh, batikalova there was a major reorganization of the mechanized forces 15 uh, combat group 15 mechanized infantry was uh, located at uh, vavunia which was the next uh, hotbed of the insurgency with only a mechanized infantry company being left behind in uh, jaffna there was a combat group 13 mechanized infantry which was uh, located in the trincomali sector and a combat group 65 armored regiment which was moved down south to batikalova okay so this was the spread of the mechanized infantry uh, uh, combat groups uh, within the uh, forces as far as uh, <coughs> as far as the 15 mechanized infantry and my <coughs> uh, personal uh, commitment in the organization in the ipkf conflict is concerned it was uh, primarily at the company level because i was with uh, posted with my own mechanized infantry company as part of uh, a 15 mechanized infantry and uh, in the initial stages when the uh, first uh, conflict occurred and the situation became hot was in trincomalee where ethnic riots said uh, riots had broken out uh, between the sinhalas and the uh, tamils okay. and there was a, a threat of uh, sri lankan uh, army sending in additional reinforcements into trincomalee 
but this was against the terms and conditions of the ipkf accord because the trinko mali was uh, in the ipkf mandated uh, terrain and uh, the ipkf objected to it and we had to undertake uh, a sensitive uh, military operation at a very short notice to ensure that the sri lankan army does not uh, break the terms and conditions of the accord this also ensured and imposed a caution on the sri lankan government and the sri lankan army that the operations of the ipkf were not to be trifled with okay so when the uh, ad hoc sector headquarter was uh, moved uh, to uh, trincomalee to contain these uh, riots the deputy goc of 54 infantry division brigadier uh, kulwant singh and the commanding officer uh, colonel ashok kohli of uh, 15 mechanized infantry along with the battalion headquarters were shifted to trincomalee okay i at the time was pulled out by my commanding officer and moved to be part of the uh, ad hoc sector headquarter a uh, yeah once this uh, operation was over and the situation started uh, hotting up in uh, uh, jaffna then i was uh, moved back to my company and uh, along with my company i also inducted into jaffna and undertook uh, several uh, important uh, military operations against the ltt no okay. sir once the hot war was completed and uh, the uh, redeployment of the mechanized forces i discussed earlier had taken place i also moved to uh, wavunia and took part in uh, counter insurgency grid in our area of responsibility which was quite extensive <coughs> because we were also required to carry out recce for some unforeseen uh, eventualities and we did uh, conduct lot of uh, dismounted and uh, uh, mounted uh, patrolling <coughs> recce etc we would establish uh, mobile check posts we would establish liaison with the sri lankan security forces which were the camps which were in the interiors to ensure whether there was any movement from them or not and uh, various other uh, this thing uh, task <coughs> wherein we had to also conduct operations against uh, certain uh, secret camps of the ltt which were able to locate at a few points of time Uh, after uh, this uh, in the month of uh, june uh, 1989 there was a situation where the sri lankan government wanted the indian peacekeeping force to move out at the earliest uh, possible right and there was a disconnect <coughs> between the requirements of the ipkf and the sri lankan uh, uh, army so that was the time when again riots broke out and the situation became tense down south in uh, the kalmanise sub sector of uh, 57 mountain division and there was a need felt for additional mechanized forces uh, in that area because the region was very close to amparai which is the hub center of the armored forces of the sri lankan army and which is in the close vicinity and that was the time when a decision was taken to move a mechanized infantry company from the uh, wavunia region and my company was selected for the task and uh, we carry out a forced uh, night move <coughs> of roughly around 250 plus kilometers in 14 hours which was a very herculean effort and we became uh, deployed uh in the area of uh, samantarai okay this was also coincided with what uh, has been uh, discussed in the various forums of the ipkf being ready to uh, this thing uh, safeguard against any intervention by the sri lankan army but 
uh, there was that was a phase which was uh, swiftly over <laughs> and a broad consensus had been reached between the two governments of uh, india and sri lanka that the ipkf needs to be withdrawn and then the uh, priority shifted to uh, uh, an orderly withdrawal from the uh, sri lankan island by the indian peacekeeping force here i would like to mention that the uh, <clears throat> de induction of the indian peacekeeping force uh, from uh, sri lanka is one of the most orderly de inductions which has been performed by any military right sir in any foreign country till date when we look at the disastrous uh, move out of uh, the russian military from afghanistan the move out of uh, the uh, us army from uh, vietnam and uh, again afghanistan <coughs> it is to the credit of the hierarchy and the troops of the uh, indian peacekeeping force that we did not leave behind even a single piece of equipment or a single uh, personnel behind everything was carried out it was a well balanced withdrawal and the mechanized infantry played a key role along with the armor in ensuring this swift and uh, orderly withdrawal from the indian sri from the sri lanka right uh, and so like you said about the equipments i uh, that makes me ask uh, how uh, what was the efficiency of the ak47s against that we had the slrs so what exactly was challenges then faced you see the uh, 7.62 mm uh, slr is uh, uh, of uh, indian origin manufacture it's a good weapon but it is heavy and it is single shot <coughs> whereas the uh, ak47 is one of the most uh, renowned uh, close combat uh, Uh, weapon which has uh, ever been designed and it holds its own even today also apart right. from single it is light apart from uh, single shots it can fire a burst of three rounds to conserve ammunition and it can also fire uh, automatic burst the indian uh, slr has got a magazine capacity of 20 rounds whereas 30 plus rounds can be uh, loaded into the ak47 right sir so all all together concerned the ak47 was a more compact and more effective weapon to be utilized in uh, counter resistance operations rather than the bulky 7.62 mm the right. 7.62 mm under the conditions which were there uh, prevalent a moist hot humid in sri lanka it tended to have percentage wise greater breakdowns during combat operations than the ak47 which was of a more uh, uh, rugged uh, components right. second was the range the only advantage with the uh, uh, 7.62 mm uh, uh, slr head over the uh, Okay. AK forty seven was in terms of uh, the range, but then in uh, counter resistance operations, whether it is in the jungles or it is in the uh, population centers, the range in any case is uh, limited. the impact of the 7.62 mm slr and uh, the impact of uh, 5.56 mm ak47 entry and exit wounds is also quite interesting the 7.62 mm slr entry wound is uh, says somewhat like a uh erst while four ana coin okay where is the exit wound at times is almost roughly around 6 uh, inches it just tears apart the human body so much is the muzzle velocity of this uh, 
<coughs> a projectile of the 7.62 mm. And no matter where you hit on the part of the body is immaterial. In case immediate first aid is not available because of the shock, concussion, and the uh, extreme flow of blood which takes place, the casualty is likely to die within two to three hours. Okay. Whereas in the case of uh, seven of uh, 5.56 uh, AK-47, uh, it was difficult at times even to ascertain the entry point. It almost closes over, so small is the entry point. And the exit point itself is uh, not uh, very well defined as it is in the case of a 7.62 mm uh, bullet. However, it created great internal injuries because of the soft, uh, of, because of the lesser muscle velocity once it penetrated inside the human body, <coughs> it did not follow a, a direct course. Okay. It shifted inside when hitting against the bullets, uh, against the bones, etc. And its flight path was deviated and at times caused uh, several internal injuries also. Okay. Anything else that you would like to add? Uh account of the AK, oh, sorry, on the IPKF operations and uh, what has been India's takeaway from the entire of Pawan and the IPKF operations as well? You see, as far as the operations of the Indian peacekeeping force is concerned, that these were the first uh, major operations uh, conducted overseas under the Indian flag uh, post-independence. Right. Hitherto, for <clears throat> the uh, Indian uh, Army deployment had been under uh, the UN flag only. And this is the first exposure with the Indian military hierarchy had for accomplishing uh, uh, not only purely military objectives, but a political military mission, so to say. And it, great learnings derived as to how the Indian uh, military leaders uh, at the higher level should be looking at when assigned uh, political military objectives. So, for example, in this case, when the Indian military was uh, inducted into Sri Lanka, a copy of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord apparently had also been faxed to the headquarters 54 infantry division. How they went through it, what was uh, their interpretation of this accord, how did they discuss it within the uh, Indian military hierarchy, I am not privy to it. <coughs> but from the reactions <coughs> of the Indian military hierarchy, it is very clear that uh, they had not anticipated the uh, withdrawal by any of the uh, militant organizations or the Sri Lankan uh, government from the provisions of the accord. In case this uh, contingency had been looked at and contingency plans made to uh, counter it, this situation would have been completely different at the point of time when the hot war uh, started off. Right. So the learnings, as far as the unit and the troops level were concerned, they were uh, the uh, accomplishments uh, of uh, conducting the counterinsurgency operations. And for the apex military and the political military, <clears throat> for the political leadership, were at a different plane, wherein they had to consider all the possible consequences of intervention in a foreign country. Right. Anything else that you would like to add, sir? Well, the only one thing which comes to my mind that uh, the casualties which have been uh, suffered uh, in the Indian peacekeeping operations are uh, nearing 1300, slightly under 1300 fatal casualties killed in actions. However, the ceremonial commemoration of these casualties is missing. Okay. 
and we feel that this needs to be done as a because the number of uh, 1300 or uh, 1250 or uh, killed in action is a phenomenal number when we look at the casualties which the indian army has suffered in the various conventional wars which have been undertaken and right. it needs to be entered into the ceremonial calendar of the uh, indian military to commemorate the sacrifices made by these uh, braves right. and, uh, thank you very much for your time and all the inputs that you have given so probably some steps might be taken after the policy makers of the country current policy makers do watch this interview and also the younger generation uh, so this interview might really educate them on various aspects of the ipkf operation because you know every time you hear about op pavan or the ipkf operation there are multiple perspectives that unfold and uh, yes it would really be a pleasure and a delight for the upcoming generation as well to get educated and witness the reality that had happened.